Hi, this is Ken Brownlee with the Brownlee Group, Keller Williams, and I have the pleasure of uh, talking with Ross Spanner today. Ross, thank you so much for being here. Good to be with you, Ken. Thanks. No, thank you. He's with Ross Spano Law. Um, he's going to talk about estate planning and several other topics, and I would love for you to learn more about him. Uh, do me a favor on the link below, uh, like us, and also follow us. Ross, I've got a lot of questions. Uh, obviously, in real estate, people always have a lot of questions. Would love to talk to attorneys on a regular basis, but are afraid to call because they're going to get a bill, <laughs> right? So hopefully we could take the time and just cover a lot of topics that people have and that maybe you can enlighten us on because a lot of times we wait until it's too late yeah. when the cow gets out of the fence and sure. problem. Yeah. Um, estate planning. If you could, first of all, tell me what is estate planning? How do you label estate planning? That's a great question, Ken, and uh, most people will immediately jump to, well, that's what you do when you decide what happens to your stuff when you die, right? I mean, that's the only... It's really a lot more than that. I mean, there are two big questions. One is obviously, yeah, how is my estate, my stuff, my things going to pass to my family? But equally important is what's going to happen to my affairs when I'm, or if I'm ever permanently or temporarily incapacitated in some way. So both of those major issues, how are we going to navigate those things? Who's going to be responsible for handling decisions for us? Um, how are our assets going to pass? What's the easiest, quickest, uh, cheapest, quite frankly, way to do that that's going to uh, allow you to create privacy and yeah. uh, also um, harmony within your family. One of the questions I have is like, why do people not do it? Or what's the mm -hmm. reasoning for them not to do estate planning? I, I know yeah. I have my theory, but... Uh, well, there's a, a couple of, uh, are several probably recurring themes that, that I hear a lot. And one is, uh, I'm too young. Um, um, you know, I'm not planning on dying anytime soon, so why would I need to do that? Another uh, thing I hear regularly is, uh, um, you know, I really don't want to think about death. I don't want to talk about death because somehow that means I'm going to die. It's kind of a superstitious kind of a, a belief. Um, or another one is, um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not rich. I, I don't have much to speak of. You know, I own a home and some accounts maybe and maybe some life insurance. And why do I need an estate plan? You hear the word estate. Well, I don't have an estate. That's like a huge, you know, 160 acre farm or whatever. No, estate is just the word we use to describe what you own, your affairs. Um, another thing that people talk about is uh, they'll, they'll say, well, that's really expensive. I mean, isn't that expensive to do that? And I, I don't have the money to do that. Um, another thing is, you know, it's, it's a lot of work and I don't want to think about some of the things I've got to think about. It's uncomfortable. I'd okay. say some of the, those are some of the recurring comments that I hear. I know a lot. It's like, I think my opinion is, is well, if I die, I don't really care. But I guess one out of three people end up in some kind of disability. Yeah. And if, uh -huh. if, if they're incapacitated that they can't really make decisions, they right. want to, but they can't. Sure. It's a big problem, is it not? It's huge. It's really, really big. And that kind of goes along with what I was saying a moment ago, that sure. a big part of the state plan is what happens if I'm incapacitated in some way. You know, who, who among my family or my friends are going to make some of these decisions for me? And if we haven't appointed someone to do those things for us, uh, particularly in the context of, of real estate, well, who's going who's gonna to sign the listing agreement if we need to sell this house? Um, who's going to go to the, to, to the closing and sell this? Or uh, So you, you, if you don't have those things in place, you have to initiate what we call guardianship. It's very expensive. It requires an attorney um, or it requires a court and uh, recurring uh, uh, annual reports and so forth. And it's just all unnecessary. It can be easily handled with a simple estate document. I'm going to go back to um, uh, dementia or mm. people lose their mind or... Yeah. Now, at that at some point, they can't even sign a paper, even though they're 90 percent or yeah. whatever level. I don't sure. know. It's, yeah, let me if I tell you a story, kind of about least. that. Over the years uh, practicing in this area, I've had probably at least a dozen times, and that's really no exaggeration. Family members that'll come to me, or they'll call me, and they'll say, "Hey, my my mom or my dad needs help. I need to be able to sign the checks, or there's something I need to take care of for them, and I need you to help me create a power of attorney for for mom." I say, "Well, well." how's mom doing you know does she have good strong capacity well you know if you catch her on a good day she can remember what she did in 1965 or 19 but yeah she, she has a trouble with short-term memory well that creates a problem for me because ethically i can't have a client in the their mom or the dad is the client it's not the child right and so right. i can't have that client sign a document when i'm not satisfied they have capacity so you cannot wait until mom or dad or family member doesn't have the capacity because at that point 
they don't have the capacity to appoint, the legal authority to appoint someone to help them with those things. That's why it has to be done promptly. Okay. So in that case, as a, as a child, and I have parents, mine are past, but mm. you have parents. How do you bring that conversation up of, hey, mom and dad, did you yeah. plan this? Or are you ready for this? Yeah. Me or my siblings going <laughs> to handle this? Or what about blended families? Is yeah, those are, those are great questions and all tough issues to really navigate. Uh, because the last thing you want to do is create the impression in your parents' mind that you're want, you, you want to know what they're giving you when they pass away. You know, that's not why you ask them. You, you want things to go smoothly for them to help them. So the one thing I would say is make sure you involve siblings. Okay. Right? You don't want to create the impression that you're going this alone for some improper purpose. So involve your siblings in the conversation. Uh, I would create, uh, talk about the issues from a personal standpoint, uh, not necessarily about death, but maybe about, hey, you know, at some point down the road, um, I'd love to be able to help you with some of these decisions. Um, can we have a conversation the next time all of the family gets together about how, how as a family we can help you through some of these things? You see the different approach sure. and the feel that you give to, to, to parent when you approach it from that perspective. And then what was the other issue you asked? You had it was another? Just, well, like blended families. Okay, is great. It? Absolutely. Blended families are particularly tough conversations. Very to common have. now. Very, very common now. And as you may or may not know, uh, if you have a blended family and one spouse passes away, typically, uh, depending upon the estate plan or if they have, don't have one, but many times everything will pass to the surviving spouse. And then that surviving spouse has no duty to give anything at their passing to the, to the children of the spouse who passed first, right? So from a planning perspective, there are some great things that we can do to protect the surviving spouse and allow them to be able to have what they need to survive, but also guarantee that an inheritance passes to the children of the, the first spouse. And so, um, and again, I think it's always a good idea to involve everybody, um, even in the context of a blended family, to the extent that the parties get along halfway decently. Um, like at Thanksgiving dinner, is that a good time to bring it up? May, you know, maybe if, if everybody knows it's coming, okay? <laughs> uh, but other than that, yeah, after a meal. After a meal, when everybody's in a good mood and their stomachs are full, um, that would be the approach that, that I would take. But again, stressing the importance of making sure that you're not coming at this from a perspective of what potentially do I have to gain by this, but how can I help you through this process? Okay. Because, again, I'll, I'll bring up a fictitious family. If you got mm -hmm. a, two brothers, two sisters, and then you have three stepchildren yeah. from 20 years earlier, the wording is going to matter a lot when it says, I'm leaving it to my children or I leave it to the spouse, right? I mean, you would really need to lay that out with those oh, family members, correct? Yeah, it's, it's huge, Ken, and I can't tell you the number of times uh, as well in my experience that I have had folks that will, in some cases, try to do this stuff on their own. You know, they'll go to a legal Zoom or sure. some other online database and try and put a will together, and unfortunately, they the documents that that computer program spits out to you are only so good as your answers to their questions. And so if you don't know how to answer their questions, the document is not going to be effective and achieve what you want it to achieve. Just for instance, recently I had a situation with a, a, a daughter whose mom had just passed away and she sent me the will and the will had left everything to her, to the daughter. And I said, just on a, a whim, I said, do you have any siblings? Well, yeah. I have a strange brother who hasn't talked to the family in 10 years. And the last time we saw him, he dumped a bunch of junk in mom's front yard, sped off, and he's never called anybody since. And it was mom's intention to disinherit him, to disclaim him. And I said, well, the only problem with that is the will doesn't name him and disclaim him, which is required. So he's entitled to half of everything. <gasps> well, that's not what we intended. That's not what mom wanted. That's not what we wanted. So you can see the importance of making sure that the wording of these documents is done properly. Yeah. Well, as in real estate, I have this come up after the fact, which is mm. very painful, and I know the cost is high. Yeah. If they did this in advance, yes, it might be more stressful, but it, it is cheaper, though, right? I mean, we, yeah. we've talked about this in the past. It's massive ch savings, I guess, if someone planned ahead now as opposed to the family got to fight over it. Oh, my gosh, yes. Yes, it's the old um, kind of... Um, you know, pay me now or pay me much, 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 much more later. Um, it's really an investment mm -hmm. um, in my mind. Uh, and uh, I guess, unfortunately, human nature sometimes is such that people are just, well, I'll hide myself to the risk or I'll hope it doesn't happen to me. Um, 
but unfortunately, um, you know, w w w unfortunately, you don't know something's done wrong until well after the fact, and, and then it's too late. So yeah, it's very expensive to, to unwind things, and usually at that point, you've got to get the court and attorneys involved, and that's always a bad thing. Um, so the more clarity, the more certainty that you can create on the front end, certainly the better off things are going to go on the back end, um, not only from a relational standpoint between family members, from a monetary standpoint as well. All right. And then I'm going to bring up the point of a lot of people are moving to Florida. I mean, from New York, New Jersey, sure. uh, Michigan, yeah. just to name a few. Is these, these wills or testaments or any kind of paperwork that they have, is yeah. it state by state or is it a federal thing? Are they protected? And I know I'm using very large terms, yeah. but can you tell me what somebody should do if they're moving here? Is yeah, that a problem? Sure. Well, it potentially could be a big problem. It's okay. always a good idea if you move from, to, to Florida from a different state or you're moving out of state somewhere else to have an attorney and professional from that state review what you've done. And it could be in the context certainly of a trust or even a will that if the requirements for signing and notarizing those documents are sufficient here in Florida, you're fine. You may not need to do anything at all. Um, but you don't know that for sure, so it's a good idea to review those. Now, with respect to what we call advanced directives, so powers of attorney, healthcare mm -hmm. surrogate designations, living will, it's very important that those documents um, reference the Florida statute. Um, many times, uh, um, fiduciary institutions, banks, and so forth, if they don't see the reference to the Florida statute and the power of attorney, they will not accept it. So, as far as those documents are concerned, if you move here, you, you probably do need new advanced directives. But certainly, reviewing the plan is a great idea when you move. Okay. I am going to bring into this because, like an attorney with papers, uh, insurance, every time someone says, let me review your files, they go, oh, it's just a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. A lot of people miss the boat because each state by state has mm -hmm. laws on, they do. on car insurance yeah. and um, life insurance is going to change. And always review your stuff. And I'm talking about all the paperwork because you have yeah. no idea what changes and how it changes because this state is 10, 30, mm -hmm. 15, 30, 10, and you know, Alabama's a 100, 300. And we don't know what we're covering and, until the accident happens or until right. there's a loss or yeah. dementia or something and, and have the paperwork mm -hmm. ready because that's mm -hmm. just going to cut down a lot of headaches for the family. Agreed 100%. Um, and I'll just throw one thing in there um, at our firm, and I think many firms are this way, to review and consult. We don't charge a thing. So See, that's good to know. So to have the ability to be able to go in and sit down with an attorney who really kind of knows the law here in Florida, whoever that may be, whether it's our firm or somebody else, I think is an, always a great idea. What okay. you do with that information, obviously, is your decision. Okay. What about taxes on the property? Is there... Um, you know, the estate tax, there's mm -hmm. the, um, I guess I want to call it the rich man tax. There's a certain level that you mm -hmm. don't pay or you pay. Can sure. You, can you elaborate? Absolutely. And some people, and I like to refer to it as the, although I don't like death, I refer to it as the death tax okay. because I think it is a tax on death. And um, uh, so what Ken is referring to is called the estate exclusion. There's an amount that the federal law allows you to pass on to your family that is not taxed. That's the exclusion amount. This is the federal law. Right now, this exclusion amount is about uh, $11.5 million. However, however, um, really everyone in the know, so to speak, expects that number to come way, way down in the coming years. And so from a tax planning perspective, it's probably a good idea. If your estate, I think, is bumping up around maybe three, four, five million $5 million to sit down with somebody to do some tax planning because there is a way legally that you can protect up to another uh, 11 and a half million or whatever the state tax exclusion happens to be, let's say sure. it comes down to five, you can protect another five million from taxes, inheritance taxes, ensuring that all of that goes to your family instead of what would be an effective tax rate of 40%. Is it 40? 40% 40 on anything that's taxable. So, in this, and some people say, well, I don't, you know, I don't have that much money, but remember, this includes the value of your homestead, the value of any investment properties you may have, the value of life insurance policy proceeds. Comes into play. Absolutely. All of these things, any investments, 401ks, uh, IRAs that you may have, all of that together is bundled together as husband and wife. Um, so you can see when you add all that stuff together, it can accumulate pretty quickly. So, And unfortunately, if you don't know if your parents or family members have an estate, how do you know what they have in the pack, you know, right? That's a great point. So that could be a... It goes back to what we were saying earlier. Unless you have a conversation with them, 
you really don't know potentially how you might be able to help them yeah. unless you unless you broach these issues, you know, from a delicate standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what about, and again, I know we touched a little bit about if someone dies without a will or trust, mm -hmm. but can I just ask rough numbers, not your numbers, but just rough numbers, because everybody's going to be yeah. different. If, yeah. Without a will and a will and then probate, non-probate, yeah. and, and define a probate or explain a probate. Yeah, so I'd say first of all, I would, more than half of the folks that pass would pass without a will or instructions of any kind. Um, um, and, uh, and so that's not a good thing. The state gets to decide what happens to your stuff in that case. Okay. Pursuant to what's called the Florida Intestacy Law. There's no one that's appointed with the power or the control. Uh, and so you have to follow the state statute. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't particularly like the idea of the government deciding what happens to, to my affairs and uh, who in my family is the best person to, to, do, to do these things for me. So, um, so it's important from that perspective to have a plan. If you don't have an estate, if you don't have a, a plan in place, most often, in fact, even if you have a, a will, um, you have to what's called probate, which is very expensive, very time consuming, requires an attorney. There, there is planning that can prevent that from taking place. Um, and so... And how long does that take? I'm in a probate. Yeah, so probate typically, even with a small estate, takes usually about, I would say, six months to maybe even a year. If you have a larger estate, it can be a year, two years, in some cases, even more than that. Okay. I have had some probate cases over the years that have lasted four or five years, believe it or not, especially when there's infighting among, among family members or properties in other states, which is a, a, a good point maybe to bring up here. Okay. I have lots of clients, and maybe we even have some folks out there, some of your folks that, that work with you, that have clients who own properties in Florida, and maybe they have a property in North Carolina, they, you know, a, a summer home they go up to, or maybe Michigan. Uh, and that means you got to probate in this, every state where you own a property. So not only all the hassles and the expense of probating here in Florida, but also in North Carolina, and also in Michigan with a different attorney and another court and another judge, all these things just compound the time and the expense associated with probate. Okay. Well, like here we have MacDill Airport or okay. base. Yeah. And because of that, we have a lot of military people that come in for a few years, maybe five. Mm -hmm. They'll buy a home here. And I find out that they own one here, North Carolina, mm -hmm. you know, Texas, and sometimes California yeah. or somewhere else. So those folks that have all these multiple properties, they're really putting their family in a, a bad mess. They really are, um, and unintentionally in most cases, because no, they just don't know what the consequences are. And so that's why it's really a good idea. Hey, did you know that you're going to have to probate and have to open a court proceeding in two different states or three different states. I mean, depending on how many properties you have. Um, and one other thing I'll touch on too is uh, what I've run into here just recently is mm -hmm. an issue with, with realtors specifically who sure. uh, want to sign a listing agreement. Um, unfortunately, the house, just someone has recently passed, the owner of the home. So the, uh, the property is tied up in probate for a period of time. Um, and so with proper planning, we can, we can make sure, especially in today's competitive real estate market, that, that your seller has the ability to be able to turn that home quickly so it's not tied up in that program. I know you, you've uh, experienced I, that, a right? Lot, it it a happens lot. a lot more than we, than we realize, especially here in Florida. Um, and so from that standpoint, planning is very, very important. If you've done it properly, you have named someone who can sign a listing agreement immediately, has the ability to go to closing and turn that house very quickly. Well, I, I'll give an example of what happened. We had a, a lady that had a home. One of her sons lived in the house to help mm -hmm. take care of her for years and years mm -hmm. and had another son in another area. Um, when she passed, she had no will. Now, one felt he was entitled to the mm -hmm. home because he was there and took mm -hmm. care of it for years and years. Mm -hmm. And the other one felt like, no, we need to split. And then also, well, if we fix the house, who's paying for the repairs? Who's mm -hmm. paying for this? Who's getting their money back? Because the title company, when they get the, the check or the closing, they just split the money 50-50. Yeah. If, if you and I as siblings decide, no, no, I did all the work or yeah. you did all the work, right. how do we divide? And yeah. And again, that's part of, I guess, planning ahead. I know not a state as much, but okay, you're living here, so you're going to get this percentage. Sure. Or, it, or can it, you do it to that level? Oh my gosh, yes, you okay. can, can. So, and, and just so folks know, what it would happen in that, sa that particular scenario, you got one child living in the house, the other's up somewhere else. Um, so they now both own the property, half and half, their tenants in common. Okay. You probably, everybody knows what that is. You each own half the house, each the son's old house. So the one son can't tell the other, 
well, I'm staying here, or vice versa, we're selling this. No, you got a problem. They're loggerheads. And guess who has to decide that? A court. The court. You gotta, so first you got to transfer the property to the two sons. Then you got to initiate what's called a partition action with the court to force the son who's living there to sell the property so you can get your half. So imagine the scenario that you're creating, the mess that you're creating for your family when you don't do the planning that you can, you can easily do yeah. to avoid all of that. Yeah. And I, I love it when they go, well, I don't plan on dying or I'm not going to die anytime soon. No one does. I don't know of anybody that ever wakes up, hey, I should increase my car insurance because I'm about to have a wipe out for four people, right? It doesn't happen, but no. just make a little effort. Spend yeah. a little time. Ross has made it very clear that you will review some paperwork or review what they have. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and help out. Sure. Um, besides estate planning or, or blended families, is there anything that maybe we haven't covered that would make sense that that comes up once yeah. in a while. If it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think certainly there are there are things along the way that I would say we were touch we touched on a little bit earlier about family members waiting until the very last minute. All right. So I would just, I just want to kind of go back and just kind of uh, re-emphasize the importance of acting, and it dovetails just nicely with what you just said about not not waiting until the last minute. Well, I don't plan on dying. I'm not going to do this and. And that's what a lot of people do, unfortunately. They wait and then they create a, a nightmare for their family. So uh, if I would say anything really to, to, to leave with you and the folks that are watching is be proactive, be a little bit proactive. You know, we have a responsibility to our families. We really do. Um, we've cared for them. We've done our best to accumulate wealth that we can then pass on to them. Why would now, would we stop kind of looking out for them? Why would we stop trying to make plans to help them at this point? Um, we want to end well. Right. We, right. we want to make sure that, 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 that what we've accumulated now passes on effectively and most cost effectively and, and, and uh, efficiently to families. So um, that would be another thing. I would say um, maybe one other issue uh, sure. for, and we, I think we touched on this when we talked last time, but if you have uh, clients who have various properties, multiple properties, they're, in, they're investors, um, they don't really realize necessarily the exposure that they're creating for themselves and their families if they have multiple properties. Um, again, uh, on a complimentary basis, we would love to be able to sit down with them and talk about some of the planning that can be done to effectively protect themselves and their families really pretty easily, okay? Mm -hmm. um, to protect their privacy, but also to protect um, their, their pocketbook in the event that something unfortunate happens, they accidentally rear end somebody, uh, someone comes on their, one of their investment properties, falls in a hole they, didn't, they weren't aware about and sues them, maybe breaks their neck. God forbid that should happen. Um, but the, what we want to do is try to, to do what we can to help protect those uh, investors. So uh, if you have any folks out there that own multiple properties in their individual names or with their husband or maybe with a child, uh, we want to do what we can to protect to protect their investment. Okay, without going into great detail because I know it's mm -hmm. a big topic, but mm -hmm. you're saying maybe a land trust or an LLC or, or some kind of protection for as, each for as, the homes. Yeah, absolutely. Land trusts, uh, uh, multi multi member LLCs. Um, if you want real 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 privacy, but also have control, which some people want, the land trust. You sure. lose a little bit of the control there, but. Um, um, there are a few states, including Wyoming and Nevada, that, that will allow you to set up LLCs, domiciled in those states, and own, own properties around the country sure. where no one will know even who you are. So if someone wants to see you, they won't even know what you own. They'll have no clue. So, and that's there. like a land trust, or are you saying it's better than a land trust? In my opinion, it's somewhat better than a land trust. Because you have more control. You have more control over it. Because a land trust, you literally are just the beneficiary that's and not the, really... See, that's the issue with a land trust. With uh, some of these other types of LLCs, domiciled in other states, you have the benefit of the asset protection, but also the absolute privacy. Absolute privacy. So, yeah, there's some really cool, effective things that can be done with regard to uh, that's asset good to protection. Know. Yeah, Because we actually deal with rental properties. We deal with a lot of investors that want to buy second mm -hmm. homes or mm -hmm. primary uh, that can that are now converted to investment because they're right. moving. And there's a lot of income that's in there. And there's also a lot of um, asset that grows very quickly. Sure, sure. And you need to protect that. And just this whole topic of when you buy something, you want to protect it. And if you work so hard 40 years of doing this, the last thing you want to do is have the state tell you what to do with your money or give it to that one person that you don't want to give it to anymore because you realize that 
they were a problem child, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, right. not child, I don't want to say it like that, yeah. but it's a problem that they don't need to have that kind of money. Maybe you need to set up some kind of annuity or set something else up yeah. or have somebody in control. And that's the kind of thing that you can help lay out. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, we, we can, we can and, and during a consultation, those are, the, those are the, uh, the things that we do. We find out what your particular situation is, what the scenario is, what your goals are, what you want to achieve, and then we'll lay out your options. And then you, would decide, you decide what works best for you. Uh, no expectation, no, uh, no sell on my part. It's, kind of, it's not my personality. It's not what I do. I just love helping people. Good. Awesome. And again, I'm going to go back to, again, somebody has four children mm -hmm. and they always assume the oldest takes it. But sometimes you rely on number three because they're the financial person or absolutely or yeah. you know that they're going to play fair with the rest. Sure. And that's a good point you just mentioned there, because the Florida intestacy law does give preference to the oldest child. So if you haven't said, I want that third child who I trust more to handle these issues to do it, it's not going to be the third child. It'll be the first child that's a spendthrift and doesn't know how to manage anything. Yeah. Okay. So that's another reason why it's important to plan. I know. It's, it's fantastic. I, mm -hmm. I'm bringing the half of this up because this is what I run across because people <laughs> didn't plan and exactly. somebody else got sure. it. Sure. Well, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Everyone, again, please uh, like our page uh, on Facebook. Also, go to Ross Spano and uh, set up a time. Go over your paperwork with them. Um, and just see what you might need to correct. Or if you're good, he'll, he'll let you know. Ross is a fantastic friend of mine. Uh, love him to death. So thank you again for everybody being here and like our page. Thanks.